This conference will now be recorded. All right. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to another Eco Postline seminar series. I'm Emily Lamachi. I'm the co lead of the seminar with Sienna Krauser. The seminar is part of NOAA Eco Postline's biannual seminar series focused on the ecosystems of the North Pacific Ocean, Bering Sea, and U.S. Arctic to improve our understanding of ecosystem dynamics and application of that understanding to the management of living marine resources. Since 1986, this seminar has provided an opportunity for research scientists and practitioners to meet, present, and provoke conversation on subjects pertaining to physical and fisheries oceanography or regional issues in Alaska's marine ecosystem. You can visit the eco website webpage for more information. Um, we thank you for joining us today. You can um, please make sure to mute your microphones and that you're not using your video. Um, during the talks, you are welcome to type your questions into the chat. And we will um, come back to those at the end of the talk. And our first speaker today is Phyllis Stavenow. She's a physical oceanographer at the Pacific Marine Environmental Lab. She conducts research into the impacts of climate change on high latitude marine ecosystems. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Maybe. I might have to be turned off. All right, I couldn't get to work last time. Why don't you do it, Emily? I'll work this still. All right, push it all up. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so, good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to talk about the history of the M2 mooring and some of the other long term moorings in the Bering Sea. Uh, this M2 has been out for almost 30 years, and while it may not be a team of thousands, it certainly was a large number of people over these years that have been able to maintain it. Funding has come from a variety of sources besides our typical ones, um, AUs, uh, NSF, the Arctic Research Program, and even the Poly Commission provided money over two years. Uh, so, Eco Foci began in 1984, and we began observations in the Gulf of Alaska, moving north into the Bering Sea, and finally into the Chukchi. Um, as I say, my interest is looking at the moorings. At the moment, there's five long-term moorings in the Bering Sea. Next slide. Um, M2 in the south, which was deployed, like I say, for the 29th year. Um, M5, M5. Sorry, M4, M5, and M8, and we began three years ago a mooring north of St. Lawrence. Okay. So, this is the time series. This is temperature time series at M2. And just, um, you know, kind of a short history of it. In 1993, uh, we were inspired by the Toba Tower Ray to put a long term moorings in the Bering Sea. Um, the next year, we begged, borrowed, and stole money. We didn't steal, we just begged, borrowed uh, money, and we deployed the first morning again from the Freeman's Winter Cruise in 1995. That was not one of our great successes. The ice was far, fairly far north. We gambled that the ice wouldn't come down, and within six weeks, the ice had come down and eaten the morning. Fortunately, we found it later. Um, it's not a picture up at the top, but ice does the mooring surfaces, what you see in the center there, basically rips everything off the top. Um, but we began to uh, put another mooring out in uh, April, May of that year, and that began, began this time series at M2. So the first year, we did deploy in the winter, and we then formed the rhythm of deploying a surface mooring in April, May, um, and a subsurface winter mooring in September, October. Uh, the surface mooring uh, had measurements at about every three meters of temperature and the upper 30 meters or so and five meters below that. And scattered within that was temperature, or sorry, salinity, fluorescence, et cetera, with an ADCP. 
So one of our big concerns when we get began M2, we had looked at how many fishing fleets, uh, boats were around it. And M2 is a very popular place, but it's where we wanted to deploy for ice. And so we named the mooring after Peggy Dyson, who maintained a radio channel up there talking uh, to all the fishing fleet. And she would say, please don't pull up my mooring. And I think that was very successful for us. Over the years, we had two times um, where a fishing boat uh, yanked up or pulled up part of the mooring. Uh, so those are the next two gaps in the data. Um, and then, of course, COVID. Um, we had COVID on a ship. We couldn't do the cruise, et cetera. And then between that and the sea ice. So this is the time series, temperature from zero to about 70 meters uh, over all the years. The warmest temperatures occurred in 2019. They were almost 16 degrees on the surface. So if we also look to the far north is M8. It also had an interesting uh, history. Uh, we decided we wanted to deploy in the north and uh, so we put a test mooring out because we weren't sure how well it would go and we wanted to measure at 15 meters we lost that mooring <laughs> uh, the ice ate it some later work uh, that peggy sullivan led showed that ice keels at m8 can be 22 meters and uh, so in the end we decided to design the mooring at m8 to go from the bottom to about 20 meters um, and gamble with it. Uh, we've been very successful up there. You should take a look at it. Um, the fishing fleet isn't up there, and we've successfully done it uh, for the last uh, about 19 years. Uh, our problem, of course, is last year was the Dyson broke down and they did not turn around the mooring. So we'll see what happens to that. But um, you can just looking at it, you can see the same patterns. You know, MA shows the nice deepening in the fall um, and the sending of heat to the bottom, and then the cooling as ice comes over. Uh, next slide. If we look at it, it's a little bit easier to see the, the same patterns uh, when you look at the uh, two anomalies. So you see the warm periods. Uh, since 2014 at both sides. You see the colder uh, things from 2006 to 2013. And we began in 2005 at M8, and there's indications that that was slightly warmer also. So what we're seeing, you know, when you look at M8, you think, oh, you see warming. Maybe not. And that is, we need to do a bit more work earlier there, see what kind of data we can find, et cetera. Next slide. So there's a lot of ways of looking at this data. You know, the depth contours are that thing. So the top panel for both M8 and M2 are the depth integrated temperature from each of those mooring sites, and we subtract it off the annual signal. And so you're now looking at it, the anomalies. Once again, at M2, you see the warm period from 2000 uh, to 2005, the cold period from 2006 to 2013, and then the change in 2014. The same pattern uh, since 2005 occurs at M8. So you're seeing the whole shelf change together. It's not, we all, I thought, that the south was more separate from the north. Uh, they are connected, the timing, it, and this all depends on ice, as I'll discuss later, but there's a very great similarity of what happens across the shelf. Next slide. So let's take a quick look at M8, and you say, okay, why is temperature important? Uh, one of the importance is for Al Herman's model. Um, he uses the uh, moorings all the time to tune, et cetera, his model. But the other is just how things function. The center panel is a percent ice cover in a 25 kilometer box, square kilometer box around the mooring site. The bottom one is top and bottom temperatures. 
Um, and you know, this turns out to be pretty important. Next slide. For instance, Polly had a preference of waters above one degree, zero degrees, somewhere in there, a little bit. Okay. This line here is about at minus 0.5. And this is what you see. 2005 had some uh, above, the, the part above the line shows the duration of temperatures above the, above the this is minus 0.5, similar for zero, etc. And what you see beginning in 2014 is a marked increase in the duration of that. That goes with what we've seen for walleye pollock distributions. This warmer bottom temperature provide a corridor for them to go north. If you look at the C2 or the Chachi moorings, um, they also have warmer temperatures on the bottom in the winter. So it's a habitat that they can go into. Um, historically, those temperatures were minus 1.6 for most of the uh, summer. You get a little blip of warming in the fall. Um, and then it would cool very rapidly. So you basically had no warm autumn temperatures. But what we've seen since 2014 is a marked increase in the duration of this warmer temperatures on the bottom, which makes it open to many species. It also causes problems in all likelihood for crab, or, uh, snow crab, who don't, yeah, who prefer the colder temperatures. And so these are what these long-term measurements tell you. It's how things change and what the patterns are. And yeah, this is just from M8. And yeah, every time I look at M8, I say, oh, I wish I'd begun in 2000 to have a longer time series. But I think that's inevitably everybody's wish for the beginning of these long time series. Next slide. So what causes all of this stuff? It's sea ice. The presence of sea ice. This is a plot of the aerial ice extent on the eastern Bering Sea shelf for three months, March, April, and May. And the most extensive sea ice in uh, April occurred in 2012. The whole Bering Sea shelf was covered. Um, just a few years later, in 2018, there was virtually no sea ice on the shelf. And shown in the lower right is the aerial map of maximum sea ice at 18 and maximum, uh, next slide. The difference between these two is 700,000 square kilometers of ice cover. That is uh, bigger than the area of California and Oregon together, and most, uh, you know, or most of the Eastern states. This is a huge area um, where there was the ice extent it, uh, advance and retreat is among the largest in the world. And the variability shown here is also immense. You can see historically there was variability, but nothing like we saw in the issue. Next slide. So let's look at these time series and add uh, ice into it. That's that kind of purplish color. You can see, you know, just looking at the ice, M8 looks like we had periods of mainly 100% ice cover. And then beginning once again in 2014, you see some changes. The bottom one is M2. M2 was chosen because it always, almost always had ice at it as we did the analysis. You can see now that there's long periods where there's virtually no ice at M2. Next slide. So here's the comparison. You can, you know, you know the similarity that extends the ice in certain Years, excuse me, um, are there shown at the bottom is the average ice extent in this 25 kilometer. Yeah, M8 is extensive, M2 is variable with maximum ice extent in that in late March. So this was, I just did this now. I thought it was really interesting. This is the anomaly of ice, and it shows how sharply things have changed. Uh, once again, 2014 appears to be the shift year for us. Um, when you look at the average temperatures, the 
can see how they agree with the presence of ice and the absence of ice. Years with a lot of ice, you get cold temperatures. Years without ice, you get warm temperatures. Okay. So, so that's what we've done. As we said, these were measurements, you know, early on, every three meters of temperature at the top, every five meters in the bottom. And, and this is the type of mooring design we had. There's met package, you know, TES, um, currents, chlorophyll, uh, fluorescence. And then once in a while, we'd have nitrate and oxygen in par. And Catherine Birdjock always put one of her passive acoustics or near this. And if you look at fluorescence, that's the type of time series you would get. So we partnered with the EK program and we changed the upper part here. We now have a prowler here uh, that goes up and down. That is the type of data you get in the upper 50 meters. A number of people have begun to do papers on this uh, major advance in technology, including Jens, uh, Noel, Calvin Morty, and I think Haley is also going to discuss a bit of this in the next presentation. Thank you. All right, we have some time for questions. I don't see any in the chat yet, so we can start in the room. Um, in the ice anomaly plot that you showed, it my eye wants to trace a very periodic wave, and that is that representative of maybe like uh, uh, some multi-decadal signal that might be in there, PDO or some other long-term mm -hmm. trend, or is it still it's it might just making stuff up? Yeah, it's too short. I mean. The, I think one of the reasons I showed M8 and M2, what you see in M2, and the indications you see in M2 are different than what you see at M8. And yeah, they're 10 years difference in length. And 30 years provides a greater insight of variability and that type of thing. Certainly in the southern shelf, it appeared there was a five, six year cycle for a while, but that looks like it's disappeared. I think the next five years, 10 years are going to be fascinating. Is it going to be um, a general warming with the cycle on top of it? Or is it going to get warm enough in the south that you just don't have ice in the south again because of the Gulf? And um, I've seen both predictions. And I think it's what you want to believe at this point um, on how it is. My suspicion is you could have ice in a given year. For instance, this year we had ice at M2, but it was just at M2. You went 10 kilometers further west, and there was no ice. The ice only made it to the 70 meter ice of that, um, which is interesting. The patterns of weather said it should have been more extensive. So um, Ray and I are doing some work on trying to understand how warmer temperatures affect the events of ice and um, her with the um, uh, the ROMS model and me with just an analytic thing. And, um, and so we're trying to move forward, have a better understanding of the Southern Bering Sea. Wait, Yes, so just this pattern, that's super interesting. Do you have any comments on why 2017 it kind of started in the sub subsurface? And I will steal something from Yance. <laughs> And what Yens has seen is this appears to be larger phytoplankton <laughs> cells. And um, it, I just saw the plots um, earlier this week, or maybe it was Friday. And that's it, because when I first saw that, I thought, oh crap, something is upside down. Um, but, you know, all the results show this. And so Yance has done some really nice work looking at this, and it looks like they're larger cells. And so that meant they fell down. The question now is how do they have enough light to exist in the whole, you know, from 30 to 70 meters? And that I think is an interesting question. Yes, Don, yeah, the bloom was before the parlor was deployed that year. Um, you see the spring bloom in the winter pouring at two meters. Yeah. But 
that's high production at the bottom is strange. Um, what rate does the parlor grow up and down? It, it climbs up with wave action and it goes up and down very rapidly. We keep one hour data. Okay. I suspect you could have more than one hour data, but it's an eye. So it climbs up and it falls down and it climbs up and it falls down and it goes up and down as fast basically as it can climb and fall. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and also at about a meter every eight seconds, profiling on descent. Great. Um, thank you both for more time. And the speaker is Kaylee Seinars, the PhD student at Oregon State University in the College of Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences. Uh, with a concentration on ocean ecology and biogeochemistry for research focuses on measures of ocean productivity using dissolved gases and isotopes as tracers of biological productivity. Right. Uh, great, thank you, Emily and Deanna. Um, can you hear me and see my screen all right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so today I'll be talking about net community production rates by oxygen nitrogen gas ratios at M2 um, in the southeastern Bering Sea from 2021. And this is work um, that wouldn't be possible without all of these co authors. So, to start off, um, just a brief overview of primary productivity. Um, this is the rate of production of organic matter by phytoplankton. Um, and this phytoplankton production fuels the ecosystem which is then consumed by zooplankton and fish, crabs and whales. Um, and generally, primary productivity is an estimate of the food available to the ecosystem as like an upper limit. Um, and in this diagram, we see phytoplankton here um, in the surface, uptaking carbon and producing organic carbon. And then some of that um, organic carbon is respired by those phytoplankton themselves. Um, they get grazed upon by zooplankton, and there's also zooplankton respiration that's kind of in this upper box. Um, and then where that organic carbon ends up depends on the ecosystem and everything else that's happening as well. Um, so next I'm going to go over a few metrics of primary productivity that are used in this observational study um, in the Bering Sea. So first we have gross primary productivity or GPP, which is the total rate of production. For example, if you measured all the organic carbon produced in this equation or all the oxygen produced. Um, there's also net primary productivity, NPP, which is that total production minus the autotrophic respiration by phytoplankton themselves. Um, and this is, um, sorry. And then we have net community productivity, NCP, which is that gross production minus all the respiration, um, both by autotrophs and heterotrophs. Um, and NCP is kind of an estimate of like the ocean metabolism, where it's the balance between photosynthesis and respiration, um, where like, like if you just measured the net oxygen produced, for example. And um, there are a lot of ways to estimate each of these. I'm just gonna go over um, the, the basis of the methods that are shown in this talk. Um, so for gross primary productivity, this was estimated um, by diol changes in oxygen in the mixed layer uh, from Jens. And then net primary productivity, NPP. This is what people will be pretty familiar with as um, commonly measured by getting a measure of carbon uptake, either from like C13 or C14. Um, but here, this was estimated using a vertically generalized production model, which um, is based on chlorophyll, sea surface temperature, and PAR. And then net community productivity, NCP. Um, here, we're using the net biological oxygen supersaturation from an oxygen-nitrogen ratio. Um, so that's kind of getting at the net oxygen produced here. And we have to account for the physical oxygen changes as well. 
So getting more into that, I'm just gonna go over oxygen saturation. Uh, oxygen solubility is primarily a function of temperature. And here in this figure, um, this gray line here is shown as oxygen solubility concentration with temperature. And then all of these points are observations from the surface oceans. Um, so you see that these points generally fall pretty close to that line that would be estimated if um, oxygen was at saturation. Um, but they're not quite there. And the difference from that saturation tells the story. So for example, this point is at around 110% saturation. So it's 10% like super saturated. Um, if you look at the difference um, in concentration there from that line. So that could be due to physical drivers. For example, if the water warmed rapidly, um, that would decrease the saturation concentration and make it super saturated before it kind of had time to equilibrate. Um, or from bubble processes, which could also super saturate oxygen. But it could also be from biology um, through that photosynthesis equation and producing oxygen. So how do we figure out what's biological and what's physical? Uh, we can separate the biological oxygen portion of that from physical using an abiotic gas tracer along with oxygen. Um, for example, this is commonly done with oxygen argon ratios because argon is a really good, um, it, it's, it's very similar to oxygen in physical properties. So we can kind of um, take out the physically caused oxygen changes um, with that. Um, but argon is a little trickier to measure. So here we're using oxygen nitrogen ratios and we get those from a gas tension device, which is shown here that measures the total dissolved gas pressure. And when we use this alongside an oxygen sensor or an optode, we can get that oxygen nitrogen ratio. Now nitrogen doesn't respond quite so similarly to oxygen in terms of physical forcing. Um, so it's less perfect than argon, but we can kind of adjust for those differences if we know the water mass history. So in this talk, um, I'm actually gonna be showing data from oxygen nitrogen prime, which was um, developed by Robert Isette as a way to kind of like convert nitrogen into responding like argon based on what we know happened in the water mass, if it warmed or if there were high winds, that kind of thing. Um, and this is pretty simple to deploy and requires minimal maintenance, which is great um, in terms of getting more data with it. Um, this was tested in a shipboard comparison in 2019 in this same region, and it worked pretty well. Um, so here we're using this oxygen nitrogen ratio to estimate net community productivity rates using a simple model in the surface mixed layer. So where was this deployed? Um, this was deployed at M2, as Phyllis was just talking about, in the Southeast Bering Sea. And this area of the shelf is highly productive. It's a foraging area for seabirds and marine mammals and is also home to commercially important fisheries. And M2 has been shown to be pretty representative of this area of the shelf. So um, this gas tension device or GTD was deployed at six meters on M2 in 2021. And the mooring stayed out until February of 2022, um, just before ice cover. So I'm gonna be showing a few prowler profiles um, showing kind of an overview of the water column um, over time from 2021. Uh, and, and this prowler is located pretty much right next to M2. So um, we have depth on this axis and then temperature where we see that it's pretty well mixed and cold at the start of the season. And then it becomes more stratified and warm um, into spring, becomes very strongly stratified through the summer period um, and, and a lot warmer at the surface. And then here you see the mixed layer deepening and the water column becoming pretty well mixed by late fall. Uh, okay, next we have chlorophyll. Um, this scale is attenuated, so 
the actual values in the bloom are much higher than five, but this is kind of to show other patterns as well. So here we see the spring bloom with high chlorophyll concentrations in the surface. Um, then after the bloom, you see much lower concentrations through summer, since a lot of the nutrients have been used up in that spring bloom. And then at the same time that that mixed layer is deepening, um, and there are some strong wind events, we see evidence of a fall bloom with um, greater chlorophyll concentrations in that period as well. And then oxygen percent saturation is shown in this bottom panel where we see high oxygen supersaturation in that bloom period in the spring. And then um, or, uh, percents that are a lot closer to saturation through the summer. So some of those mixing events um, caused undersaturation from mixing of deep water at that point. And then you can't, it, it's, it's a lot harder to tell if there's a fall bloom in this oxygen data um, as it's shown, but we do see like a change from undersaturated after some of those mixing events back to um, closer to saturation. So some of this could be from biology producing um, at the same time as this chlorophyll concentration is elevated. So next I'm gonna go into some productivity metrics. And just to start out here, we have um, chlorophyll concentration shown on the right axis in green. These are both five day moving averages. And then we have net primary productivity shown um, on this axis in millimoles of oxygen per meter cubed day. And this one was based on that, um, that, that model that includes chlorophyll. So you'll see that they have pretty similar patterns for um, this, this data set. And that's because chlorophyll goes into the NPP calculations. So now we're getting rid of chlorophyll and just sticking with these three productivity estimates where we have GPP in red, which is based on that um, diol change in oxygen. And then we have NPP in purple and NCP um, in blue, which is based on that oxygen nitrogen prime ratio. So, um, and, and then these are also five day averages. So um, kind of initial impressions, we expect that gross primary productivity is greater than net, um, which is greater than net community production. Um, that's kind of based on the definitions and we do see that that holds true for the most part, um, despite these being three different methods that are um, based on different data. Um, let's see, so kind of focusing on the spring bloom to start out with, we see that all these metrics have pretty similar patterns with um, the peak in the bloom. Um, there are a couple of things to note about that. One is this like dip in net community productivity. And this is um, in part because there's a mixed layer depth uh, conversion that goes into this to get it into volume units shown here, which correspond to these two, which don't directly have mixed layer depth in those calculations. Um, another thing you might note is that these um, gross primary productivity and NPP rates kind of drop off around the same time when the bloom is coming to an end and a lot of the nutrients have been used up, whereas the NCP rates have a little bit of lag. Um, and this is based on the way that we estimate NCP with a steady state model where like there's a lot of oxygen produced during this bloom and then all the oxygen doesn't just disappear um, once, once like the production slows down, it takes time for that to be ventilated um, by air sea gas exchange. So that's kind of just an effect of the time scale of the measurements. Um, past that spring bloom, we see much lower production for the summer period. Um, and then with GPP and NPP, we see kind of a small peak around that fall period corresponding to the elevated chlorophyll from the crawler and um, a fall bloom. The NCP data here um, isn't, the, the way that we estimate NCP 
has some assumptions in it that aren't really valid during this time. So I'm still working on getting a better estimate for NCP in this period. So um, compared to previous years, we're just looking at the spring bloom here. So this table on the top is an excerpt um, from Jens's paper where um, he calculated rates of GPP, NPP, um, as well as NCP um, for a variety of years for each like bloom period. And these rates are in milligrams of carbon per meter cubed day. And then below here, I have the estimates from the study from 2021 for the bloom period um, with the same units, milligrams of carbon per meter cubed day. So, and then I should mention that GPP and NPP are calculated based on the same methods um, from this paper versus the study, whereas NCP is measured differently here, um, where the 2021 data is based on that O2N2 prime from that gas tension device. So general takeaways here, um, we're always going to expect some interannual variability, and some of these were really warm years, um, but we see relatively similar values in GPP and NPP, as well as NCP, um, for these years. They're kind of in line with what we expect. Also shown here are the ratios of net primary productivity to gross and NCP to gross primary productivity, which are also relatively similar to those from that previous study, um, where, for example, like this value of 0.5 for net community production to gross primary productivity um, basically means that half of the production from, from this bloom period is available um, like for consumption or for lateral transport out of the system or export to the seafloor, that kind of thing. And this is pretty consistent with what we expect from a bloom, whereas after the bloom period when nutrients are a lot more limiting, we expect this to be much lower with, with like more recycling in that surface ocean. Um, and then just a quick comparison to another method. So if you sum up um, all of the production based on NCP rates here um, for basically the month of May, or from, from when this was deployed until June 1st, we get um, around three moles of carbon per meter squared that was produced. And if you estimate how much carbon you would expect based on the nitrate um, in the surface, which Noel Pelland calculated um, based on this paper, you get around 3.66 moles of carbon per meter squared. So those are roughly in the same ballpark for how much carbon um, is available to be, or so, sorry, for, for like the, the carbon available based on the nutrients um, that allow that production. So kind of to sum up overall, um, this data provides a more complete picture of the seasonal patterns um, for, for, for what's happening in this region of the Bering Sea. Um, and also contributes to like, our understanding of both interannual variability and um, those, those seasonal patterns. So um, next steps for this. Um, I think this is a neat method that really enhances our, like, the, um, it, it makes it so we can get a lot more productivity estimates uh, in, in places where um, ships can't spend that much time. So um, to kind of enhance these measurements, a GTD and Optode have been installed on the Sekuliak since late 2020, continuously collecting data wherever they go. Um, this gas tension device was deployed again this year in 2023 at M2. And then there's also potential for more autonomous deployments, for example, on sail drones in the future. And then um, back to some of the data that I showed, I'm also going to be working on quantifying that fall bloom based on NCP rates from the gas tension device um, by incorporating the entrainment of deep water during that period when the mixed layer was deepening. 
So that's all for today. And I'd like to acknowledge a number of funding sources that made this possible. Thank you. Thank you, Haley. Do we have any questions from the uh, room? Um, yeah, this, this is great stuff. Um, realizing you only have a, a few data points for the ratios, do they in general line up with the idea of a bigger ratio of net community production to gross primary production under cold conditions than under warm? Um, that's a good question. So the comparisons that I showed before were just for each bloom period. Um, so time wasn't really considered in that it was just selected based on um, like the two weeks on or, or the, the like week on either, either side of that peak. Um, but yeah, I, I would have to look into that more. Okay, thanks. Are there any questions from the chat? Or if someone wants to unmute themselves? Yeah. So when you were showing the parallel data, it seemed when you had like both the temperature and all the other measurements that you would have a bloom and then it was just done like it seemed very stark like where like like within a day like I, I noticed with a lot of the temperatures it's like temperature is this temperature then all of a sudden the next day it goes right down now, i don't know if that has something to do with how you smooth the data when the way it's done or something but especially with the bloom data it seemed to just cut right off like you had it and then it was over um is there can you comment on that Oh, you muted. Are, are you talking about the um, productivity estimates, like showing GPP and NPP? No, the it was the okay. probability that you had before, okay. like over time. That's yeah. Yeah, um, there wasn't any smoothing done to that data that would have caused that. Um, That's really interesting to me. Uh, yeah, I mean, one thing to look at would be like the mixed layer depth changes. Um, I don't know that there was anything like significant that happened towards the end of the bloom. Um, I think it was most likely just that like the, the nutrients had been consumed at that point and um, the, the like dominant phytoplankton were kind of at the end of their life cycle. It was just, it was really interesting to see that. Hi, Haley, uh, Evan. Um, so I think that chunk of the Bering Sea is kind of a hotspot for sedimentary denitrification and oxygen demand. Does that do anything in terms of your mass balance or the uh, the gas tension device? You know, I don't I don't really know what assumptions go into the gas tension device that might be modified by those sort of extra fluxes. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so that 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 would have an effect. Um, and it depends on what time period you're looking at. Um, for a lot of the calculations where I'm saying that like the data is valid, that's when we're assuming that there's not a lot of vertical mixing. Um, so a lot of so so like I would be assuming that those fluxes that are happening at the seafloor are not affecting the data at the surface. But when there is a lot of vertical mixing or um, entrainment of deep water. That, that would affect those estimates. Thank you. Hey, Haley, so I know that characterization of the oxygen oxide is really important in order to, uh, you know, from, from our own discussions. Are there any other particular measurements that you think that you would request to make this data set a little bit more useful for you in the future? Um, not just for our own field work, but you know, for the, uh, the, the 
the associated field work on, on vessels like this LIAC and all lessons learned that we could uh, pass along to get better data sets to, to work with. Yeah, I mean, like you said, the oxygen is very critical um, to, to those calculations. So, I mean, I, I would say that the most important thing is just to get calibrated oxygen measurements more often. Um, and like as often as possible, especially at the deployment and the recovery to, to yeah, um, take, take Winkler samples and show that we can really trust the oxygen data. Um, as far as other sensors, um, I would have to think on that more, but I think that the number one would definitely just be getting oxygen data that we're confident in. Well, uh, let's give Haley another round of applause because we were muted the first time. She didn't hear how loud we were. So. <laughs>